So this is really um, to focus on the genetics of Dravet syndrome, what Dravet syndrome really, really is. And, um, and we'll have a review of what that means in genetic terms, but also an overview of um, what lies ahead of us. And I think um, we are really at times where the field is moving quite quickly and we've got lots of new developments and, we'll, um, and I will talk about that as well. So um, we'll start, I'll start right at the beginning, um, at the brain. So Dravet syndrome is a disorder that mainly affects the brain and nerve cells in the brain. And if we think of the brain, we think of the brain has got different regions. So the brain really controls everything we do. It controls um, our thoughts, our moods, our movements, and there's different parts of the brain. For example, there to the left, what's called the frontal lobe, it's the front of the brain, and that's really important for cognition, for memory, to, be, to the ability to concentrate, and we've got the uh, parietal lobe, which is, plays an important role um, for, for the senses, then the occipital lobe, which is important for vision, we've got the cerebellum at the back, that's really important for movement and how we um, uh, move our body, and then we've got the temporal lobe, that's really uh, important um, for memory, so it contains the hippocampus, which is an area that's really important for, um, for memory. And then we've got the brainstem, that really is the brain's warning system um, and sets alertness and controls breathing and, and really lots of vital functions. And the brain consists of 100 billion nerve cells. That's a tremendous amount of nerve cells. All the nerve cells look fairly similar, so you've got um, at, uh, so you've got the body of the nerve cell, and then you've got what's called the axon that connects the nerve cell to lots and lots of other nerve cells. So we really have, the brain is a, it's a vast network of cells. So they're all connected to each other. And of course, what's really important is that all these um, nerve cells, um, can, just, is, it, is the sound okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. That's great. So uh, what's really important is that that is all coordinated and that all the information, um, how each nerve cell talks to another nerve cell is coordinated and how nerve cells talk to each other is via electrical impulses. And those are then generated from the nerve cells. So it's really important that that happens um, without fault. And so how do nerve cells do that? So we've got the nerve cells here and what we can see in the membrane of the nerve cell, um, and that's the cell membrane, we've got ion channels. And these ion channels are there for um, different ions, such as sodium ions or potassium ions, to travel through and to generate what's called an action potential, meaning where we have got a burst of electricity and information um, traveling down one nerve cell and then um, um, connecting to another nerve cell. So it's really, really important that we have got good connectivity between different nerve cells and that when the nerve, text, nerve cells talk to each other by electrical impulses, that that all works very well. And um, the sodium channel alpha-1 subunit is one of those ion channel um, proteins, it's a voltage-gated ion channel protein for, um, for, for sodium ions. And that really, so you can see how important these sodium ions are across the entire brain um, and in, in all the nerve cells that are in our brain. And when we really talk about Dravet syndrome, that's an, I would call it an ion channel disease. Um, because we know that in Dravet syndrome, the sodium ion channel doesn't work properly. And therefore that affects a number of areas throughout the brain. And first of all, it affects the hippocampus in different parts of the brain that then might, then, that then might lead to seizures. So here, that's what we, it's a picture of an EEG, and, um, and every child, you, you know this all, um, 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 will have every child with epilepsy uh, will have an EEG, and there we can see the brain activity and whether there might be um, disorganized activity such as an epileptic seizure. And what we also know is that um, children who have Dravet syndrome and adults um, have um, unsteadiness, what we call ataxia, so often difficulties with walking. And we know that the, um, the um, sodium channel is also expressed in the cerebellum, so which is in the back of the brain, and which is important for movement. So we know that um, the cerebellum is affected by the sodium channel um, defect 
and that then predisposes that individual to have difficulties with movement. And we also know that the sodium channel is expressed in the front of the brain, so in the frontal cortex, and that's really important for concentration, that's important for learning, um, and we know that children with, and adults with Dravet syndrome have difficulties with these areas, and that is likely because the sodium channels that are in that part of the brain are, are affected, and that part of the brain can't work properly because of that. And we know that um, a lot of individuals with um, Dravet syndrome have what we call autistic traits or might have been diagnosed with, with autism. And, and again, there's good evidence to show that if your frontal part, front part of the brain is not working properly, then you might have difficulties with social interaction. You might have difficulties um, that um, manifest themselves as signs and symptoms of autistic features. So it's just giving you an overall view of how in Dravé syndrome, we've got um, ion channels that are expressed across the entire brain and then um, presenting with different types of problems, um, depending on which network or which part of the brain is affected. And we talk about um, the spectrum of SCM1A related epilepsy. So we know that uh, at the severe end, SCM1A related epilepsy can, uh, is responsible for Dravet syndrome, but we also know that at the milder end, we've got um, genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, um, also called GAS plus, or febrile seizures plus. So this might be um, individuals either with GAFs plus and F febrile seizures plus or with Dravet syndrome might have um, equally an SCM1A um, mutation. However, those mutations are slightly different uh, and present in different ways because one individual might present with a very severe disease and others might present with milder disease. And I will come back to that later in my presentation. That also relates to some of the questions that uh, you've posed to me. And so I think if we talk about how the brain cells interact with, with each other, it's all a question about excitation and inhibition. So it's a balance between excitation, that's the activity that comes from a nerve cell, and inhibition, that's when a nerve cell puts on a block to say, well, I've had enough. So you need both. You need to communicate, you need um, excitation to pass on information, but also you need to have the ability to, if the information becomes too much, to stop it. And there's different nerve cells in the brain who do that. So you have um, here on the right hand side, you can see a diagram. So you can see on the left at the um, diagram of the um, nerve cell that I showed you before. And here again, there's again nerve cells, that's the body and that's the axon and then connected to a different nerve cell. And in um, orange or red, I've uh, marked uh, an excitatory nerve cell. So this would be a nerve cell that fires off uh, information to then pass on information. And here in yellow, I've illustrated um, an inhibitory nerve cell. So this is a nerve cell that typically would block uh, another nerve cell to say, well, hold on, you've had too much information, we need to stop here. Yeah? And it's this balance between the two. So if this one fires off and this one can then stop it sometimes to make sure you don't have too much or too little information. And what happens in Dravet syndrome, it tends to be that those nerve cells that are normally what we call the inhibitory nerve cells, those are the nerve cells who block other nerve cells, they don't work properly. And they don't work properly because the SCM1A gene um, and protein that causes that um, is important here to make this nerve cell work is um, affected by Dravet syndrome. And that means that this nerve cell can't really send out a stop signal. So you've got the other nerve cell that still fires off, the other nerve cell can't stop it, and therefore you get too much firing. So what you basically get, you get, you can't, um, the, so the nerve cells that should block other nerve cells can't do that, and you get with a mismatch, uh, an imbalance between too much excitation, too little inhibition, and you get too much, too much excitation and then a too much activity. And that's basically how we explain um, how Dravet syndrome um, emerges from this imbalance between excitation and inhibition. What you can see here is that's not just that you've got SCN1A, um, that's one particular sodium channel, but you've also got SCN2A, 3A, 8A. So these are also sodium channels, but they're not expressed in these um, blocking inhibitory cells, but they're expressed in other nerve cells. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But I think what's important here is this balance between um, excitation and inhibition that is 
not working properly in Dravet syndrome. So when we talk about the sodium channel um, alpha, sub, uh, alpha 1 subunit, we can see that this really forms um, the, so the sodium ion channel, and it consists of what we call four homologous domains, so four domains that look identical, and these four domains group together in four domains and having a pore in the middle where the ion channels can go through. And what you can see here, you've got a voltage sensor, you've got the pore region, um, and the voltage sensor is really important to pick up information that travels from other, that, that travels across the nerve cells. And the pore region is important because that's where the sodium ions actually travel through. Yeah, and that then forms the, uh, the actual ion channel that sits in the cell membrane where then the ions travel through. And when we think about what a sodium channel alpha-1 subunit, or what that channel is, so that SCM1A channel is a protein. Yeah? And proteins are building blocks of the body. And proteins really are what builds, what makes all our, our muscles, our hair, our skin, everything in our body um, is built out of proteins. And we've got up to 400,000 um, different proteins in our body. And each protein, consists of what we call amino acids. Yeah? So amino acids are small parts of proteins. And we know that the SCM1A protein contains 200 and 2009 amino acids. So it starts here all the way through all that. Um, all of these are different amino acids that form the, the entire protein. Yeah? And that's, um, that's, so that's a string of 209 amino acids. And the master plan how to assemble each protein is contained in our DNA. Yeah, I think that's really important. So the sodium channel is a protein. The protein consists of amino acids. And the master plan, how to build all this together, is um, contained in our DNA. Yeah? So you might actually consider the DNA as the recipe book for proteins of the body. Yeah. So if you have, um, so if you have a certain recipe and um, for that recipe to be successful, you need to follow the plan. If you don't follow the plan, you might get a product that's, that's faulty. Yeah. And so what you can see in the DNA, so this is, this is uh, an extract of the DNA. So it's what's called the, uh, the double helix. And um, within the DNA, there's a string of what, called, what are called base pairs and they've got different names and they've got abbreviations and I, it's, basically, it's basically a code. Yeah? So you've got a code of A and T and G and C and you have got that all along, all along the DNA. And what you can see here is, so here you've got these base pairs and they all curl up into chromosomes and you will that remember this from your biology classes that we've got all in our cell bodies, we've got chromosomes that contain all the information um, for, the, you know, for, for the proteins of our body. Yeah? So basically what those chromosomes are, they just curl up the entire DNA as a storage system so that can be contained in all our cells. Now what's really important is that this information that's kept in here in the DNA is correct. Yeah, and that this information hasn't been altered. So, and each of those DNA protein recipes is called a gene. Yeah. So you, here you've got a fraction of your DNA. So you've got the DNA double helix here where all this information is contained. And um, a strip of that DNA will contain all the information to build, for example, one particular protein for example, the SCM1A protein. And so that particular strip of the DNA um, that contains all the information to build an SCM1A protein, that's then called a gene. So it's that, it's that part of the DNA that contains the information for one um, DNA protein. Yeah? And then what you can see here is, what then happens is that that information from the DNA is translated into a sequence of amino acids who then form a protein. Yeah? So what I showed you earlier was that you had these, num these letters um, and these letters are here. So from the DNA, it's then 
uh, transcribed into what's called the mRNA. And from the mRNA, it's then translated into different amino acids who then form a protein. Yeah. So basically, you have got the DNA recipe, which is then translated into um, the building blocks of, um, of our body into, the, into the different proteins. Yeah. And that, that particular sequence will then determine um, that the right proteins and that the right amino acids are called to build the, um, to build the protein at the end. So, and there's lots of different genes um, and each gene, as I explained, um, codes for, or is a recipe for one particular sodium channel, for example. So in here we've got, so we've got SEM1A, the SEM1A here. So it's the SEM1A gene that um, codes for the, um, the SEM1A protein. And we know that faults in that particular protein are associated with Dravet syndrome and with Geth plus, for example. But we have, for example, SEM2A is also associated, if they've got faults in SEM2A in another gene, then you end up with completely different types of epilepsy. Yeah? If you've got SC, a fault in SEM8A, you also can get an epilepsy, but it's a different epilepsy. Yeah? And that is because these different proteins sit in different nerve cells, and because they sit in different nerve cells, that might cause different symptoms. And I think why this is important is, if we look at the different, um, different genes, um, for example, here we've got an illustration of the um, SCM1A, SCM2A, SCM3A, and SCM8A. So they're all sodium channel genes. This causes Dravet syndrome, this causes different, uh, other different um, epilepsies. And here we can see when the information of this particular gene is actually expressed and whether it's expressed early on in life. So here you've got, this is before a child is born. This is when a child is very young, when a child is older or when it's much older. And you can see here that depending on the different gene, um, when these genes actually are expressed, um, it's at different time points. So we know that before a child is born, the SCM1A gene is hardly expressed. It is expressed much, it's much more expressed later on, whereas other genes, for example, are expressed very early on. And that has got relevance when we think about when actually children with um, um, SCM1A mutations actually present. And we looked at this, and here we looked at when these genes actually expressed um, and when um, individuals start having their seizures. And what we can see is here we compared the different genes, SCM3A, 2A, 8A, and SCM1A, and we compared when was the seizure onset and um, when are they expressed? Yeah, expression is when they, if they're expressed early on, um, then you've got a large um, circle. If, there's, if they're not expressed early on, you've got a very little circle. And here, when you, for example, we know that on average, um, children with an SCM1A mutation present around six months of age. And that is timed with the time when the SCM1A expression actually um, starts becoming more prominent. So when a child is really young, just born, SCM1A is just not expressed. And if you have a faulty SCM1A gene, it doesn't show up early. It only shows up later once that gene is actually more expressed. And for example, if you have a fault in SCN2A, which is a different gene, we know that that gene is expressed right at birth. And we know that children who have a fault in this gene present at birth. Yeah, they present much earlier. So this shows you, it's just an explanation why um, children with um, SCM1A mutations present at the age they present and um, present at around six months and don't present right at birth. Yeah, and that's just an explanation um, how we um, how different types of epilepsy um, that are caused by different genes present at different time points. And so how do mutations occur? So mutations mean there are changes in the genetic sequence. So what I showed you earlier was this uh, DNA strip and with all, these with all these letters that form the recipe for the protein. And if there's a change in this DNA strip, so if the information that's contained there is where one letter is exchanged for another, that is called an mutation. And so mutations are actually really important because they're the main cause of diversity among, amongst organisms. So without mutations, we wouldn't, we wouldn't live. Um, we are all different. 
because our DNA is a tiny bit different from each other. And, um, and without mutations, um, because the mutations can actually cause um, um, benefits. So you might have a mutation that uh, prevents you from, if, you're, if you, for example, have darker skin, um, you don't get sunburns, you don't get skin cancer. Yeah? And um, so there's lots of mutations that are actually really beneficial. However, uh, unfortunately, you know, what, what's happening in other, um, for, for a lot of diseases, mutations are not beneficial and they cause disease. Um, and we know that, so on, on average, people probably carry from five to 10 genes um, with mutations in each of their cells. So all of us here in this web call, all of us will have at least five to 10 changes or mutations in us that we are just not aware of because they don't cause any disease. Yeah, so mutations are something that happens all the time that we all carry and most mutations are actually not significant. They, don't, they do not cause disease. And, we, and if that's the case, so if, for example, if we pick up that somebody carries a mutation that's not relevant, we call that genetic variation because it doesn't lead to disease. Yeah, and what we now do is in the past, um, so today we prefer, we prefer the term variant rather than mutation. And we, call, we talk about disease causing variants and they're called pathogenic variants. So what you now find is if you listen to people talking about mutations and you get confused, oh, what do they mean by variants or mutations? So um, um, pathogenic variants, so these are disease causing variants and we also call those mutations. However, what I've done throughout this talk, I just stuck to the term mutation because I think that's easy to understand, um, but just to, for, for you to understand that um, if somebody talks about uh, variants, um, that's what they mean. They mean pathogenic variants that are disease causing. So how are, um, one important question is of course, how are mutations uh, inherited? Yeah, so mutations can either be inherited or they can happen newly in that individual. And if the, if the mutation happens newly in that individual, we call that de novo. Yeah, uh, which means, which, which is another term for, for new. So, and here you can see, for example, on the left, so you've got um, the mother who's, um, who's not carrying um, um, a mutation, the father's carrying a mutation, and the father carries on, passes on the mutation to the son. Whereas if you've got a de novo mutation, you have both parents, neither of the parents carry the mutation, and the mutation occurs newly in the child. And if you talk about Dravet syndrome, then in the, in the vast majority of, uh, of children with Dravet syndrome, the mutation is new. So the mutation happens in the child and is not present in the parents. Now, when we talk, just to explain a little bit more about what we mean by de, no de novo or new mutations, they can happen at three different levels. And they can happen either at the zygote level, which means that's when the very, very, very early stages, once the sperm and egg have merged, there can be um, uh, a mutation happening, or a mutation might come from a mutated sperm, or it can come from uh, a mutated egg. And I've just explained this here. So this is really the very early development of, of human life. And, and that's what's called a germline is where you've got a sperm and here you've got the egg and then you've got fertilization. And that's then called the zygote stage. So this is the very early stage. And you have, so, and, um, so you might, for example, have just a chance mutation in, 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 in a sperm, or you can have a chance mutation in, in an egg, or you can have a chance mutation once they've combined in the er very early stages of human development, you might get changes or mutations happening. Yeah, so it can happen at all these three levels. So it can happen either at the early cell level, it can happen, or it can happen at the level um, of, you know, where there might be a 40 sperm or there might be a 40 egg. And that's what's important here is that um, it's really, um, not all the sperms are 40, it's just by chance, one sperm by chance is, is, um, carries a mutation or by chance one egg carries a mutation. Yeah, that's, um, so it's really something that's you know, beyond anybody's control. Uh, and that's when we talk about that this 
mutation actually happens in that individual yeah and it's not it's not carried it's not carried by the uh, by the parents uh, so which is different from 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 here where you've got for example uh, this this would apply to to a different disease a mild disease where the the, the 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 parent is a carrier the same as a child yeah good let's um carry on and so what we did and how we detect mutations um, is by what we call DNA sequencing. And what I showed you earlier is that we've got this, um, um, this list of uh, letters and they should follow, so that's the genetic code. So you've got these different letters, C, T, T, C, T, T. So this is basically the recipe strip of the DNA and which should follow a certain sequence. And what we then do is we've got a control here where we know this should be the sequence. And then we compare that to the patient and then see, hang on, so up until here, the sequence looks exactly the same and then suddenly there's a change, yeah? So this is when the mutation has occurred and we know, ah, for some reason, this, what we would expect, the sequence is not, is not uh, present anymore and there's been a change. So, and there's different types of um, changes that can occur um, that we then call uh, mutations. And we call that different, classes of mutation and here again what's important here is what we call the the reading frame is whether the what i call the information that contained that's contained in the dna can that still be read yeah so and um if there's any change does that alter the way something is read and whether it still makes sense or not. Yeah. So if you take this as an example, so this is here, you've got the sentence, main classes of mutation. And if you have, for example, what's called a deletion, a deletion means that suddenly there's one bit of the, um, of the sequence might be deleted. Yeah. And what you then have, if you then put the same sentence together, what you get is this. Yeah. So you've got a deletion, there's, there's one letter missing. And what happens is that your entire sentence becomes unreadable, yeah? So you suddenly have, with one tiny mutation, you can get an effect that leads to that the whole sentence, or what we call the reading frame, is affected, and that actually, with that, you cannot produce a good protein, yeah? Or you might have, if you've got an, insert, an insertion means there's something added, for example, there's a, there's a letter added, what well, then happens again. So that will have an impact on the reading frame. So suddenly, what before you were able to read and it would make sense suddenly it doesn't make sense anymore yeah and you can have what we call single base substitutions so as one particular aspect is exchanged for another and for example the missense mutation you might end up with something where that's actually still readable yeah so you are, you end up with a sentence that is slightly altered but the overall message still comes across so in the same way, you might have a protein that's formed that's um, still functional, slightly altered, but might still be able to fulfill its function. Or you might have, there's other types that are called nonsense mutation, where you get suddenly a stop, then the whole thing is stopped and you can't produce a protein. Or something that's called a splice site mutation, where suddenly that's how the DNA, how the information is actually determined, um, that that again affects the reading frame. So you get something additional that shouldn't be there and you can't really make sense of that. Yeah. So what's really important is, is the reading frame affected? Does, is, this, is this mutation so severe that you can't actually make sense of what, um, what, should, be per, um, what should be produced here as, as, as the message or as then the, the protein, the functional protein? So then the question always for us is, is, is a mutation significant? Yeah. So we've got what we call truncating mutations, and we know that they lead to an abolition of the entire protein function. So the entire protein is just not present. And we know that that leads to a loss of protein function and is likely to lead to a significant uh, phenotype. Well, if you've got a missense mutation, then the question is, is that missense mutation, is this de novo? Or could it be inherited? In which part of the protein might it occur? Is, this a, is it an important part or less important part? Is it conserved across different species? Um, is there differences 
in what are the differences in the amino acid compositions? Um, is it present in normal populations? So there's lots of different um, analyses that we need to perform to analyze missense mutations to find out how significant we think they are. Yeah, so this is our mm -hmm. genetic um, uh, scientists are really excellent. So in Glasgow, we are really lucky that we've got fantastic genetic scientists and their main task is really just to, to sequence the DNA, to, to find out what is the information um, uh, in the DNA and then to make sense of, to find out how significant the, uh, a particular variant might be. And so what we, when we looked at this um, about now almost 10 years ago uh, uh, with our Glasgow cohort, then we had, and that was from um, all children, from, from over 240 children um, uh, with driver syndrome in the United Kingdom. So what we found, there was a 50-50 split. So we could see that about 50% of individuals had truncating uh, variants or truncating mutations, and they lead, lead to loss of protein function and to a severe phenotype. And we could see as 50% had uh, missense variants, often leading to reduced protein function, leading to a range of different phenotypes, all again ranging from severe phenotypes to milder phenotypes. Yeah, and this is also when we look about when we think about milder phenotypes that are associated with SCM1A are, for example, genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus, where individuals don't have a learning disability but have um, uh, febrile seizures. Um, those individuals are exclusively missense variants, yeah, and they're so they're they're, they're milder they're milder variants, yeah. But equally, we can have very severe missense variants that present with Dravet syndrome. So, this is what the uh, genetic test result or report looks like. So I've anonymized that. Um, so, and this basically gives you then the details of the patient. And at the time we, we, um, we checked for both SCM1A and PCH19, that's a different gene. And here was reported as a heterozygous SCM1A likely pathogenic sequence variant detected. Yeah? So we found that in the two copies of SCM1A that um, each of us carry, one of them has been affected. And um, affected in a way that um, the um, scientists think that this is actually likely to cause um, the symptoms in this child. And then it gives you the detailed details which specific change this is. So this is a deletion. So this is a truncating mutation. Yeah. And then it gives you um, often at the end, there's often then a question or can you please forward a blood sample from the parents um, with a detailed family history? Because then we want to know is this change also, is this change newly occurring? in the child, or is this a change that might have been inherited from a parent? For example, we would expect a change like that to be new in the child and not be carried in a parent. If you had a change, if you had any change in a parent who's entirely well, with no symptoms whatsoever, we would always be thinking, hmm, do we actually think this is, this is significant? Yeah, so this is how the reports look. And then I just explain to you some of the things where we might have caught we might have been caught out in the past. There's this concept of what we call mosaicism, and um, and that's really you know, it comes from the you know, it comes from the word mosaic, so that not every single cell is the same. And this is the same picture that I showed you earlier. So you've got the sperm and the egg f forming the new um, uh, the the embryo, and then at any later stage, what you might have is suddenly at a later stage, you might have suddenly a mutation that happens much later, and that mutation might not affect the entire body, but might only affect a certain fragment of the body. And you can imagine if your entire body is affected by the change, that's likely to be significant. However, if only a fraction of your body is affected, you might actually present with a, with a much milder phenotype. Yeah? And so it's just one of the ways how we explain how um, different phenotypes can also, might, might also um, differ amongst each other. And then, so what I, of course, we need to look also beyond the initial stages of genetics. So we've spoke about the DNA and then the transcription to RNA and then the translating into the protein. But then, of course, after this, there still are other changes that happen to the protein. There's, it needs to be stored and packaged. It needs to be transported within the cell. Um, it needs to be exported by the cell membrane. There's protein-protein interaction. There's lots of things that happen beyond 
this stage here that might also affect how the protein might actually work. And those are things that actually today we don't know much about. Yeah, um, and that's clearly, um, this might be responsible why um, certain uh, changes are more significant than other changes. So there's lots of things we know, but there's a lot of things that we don't know. And, and here just to illustrate that the interpretation of the results still remains challenging because this is an um, example of a family uh, tree. So what we do in clinic, or when you see your doctor, your doctor will then take the family history. So might have the individual here with Dravet syndrome when asked questions about all the siblings, the parents, and the grandparents, aunts, uncles. And here we have a child with a confirmed um, a mutation in the SCM1A gene, and it's causing Dravet syndrome in this particular child. But what we then found out was that actually the same, the same mutation was also carried by the brother, who has a much milder phenotype, by the mother and by the mother's brother, who also had um, milder phenotypes. And this really the question, how, how do we explain this? How can we explain that the same mutation in one individual and in in different family members might present in different ways? Because we're all different in our genetic background. So we all have different genes that might have an effect on how we actually, how a change might present. And for example, there is a possibility that we've got um, different other genes might be upregulated as or expressed more as a compensation for the defect or you might have um, other changes in other genes that I might actually counteract the defect you might find. And those changes might not be the same in the entire family. Those might be different in different family members. And that's why you can have changes even within the front family with the same, um, uh, uh, with the same variant, different presentations. And you can imagine that that makes uh, it sometimes really difficult to be precise in terms of how we counsel um, families. So just as a summary here, that so a genetic change will present according to how severe the change is, um, what the genetic background of that individual might be. There might be other environmental factors and, and that the change will affect a variety of um, different parts of the brain uh, according to where in the brain you can find this. And then what's important is that not all patients with Dravet syndrome have a mutation detected. So we know that 85 to 90% of Dravet syndrome patients will have an SCM1A mutation identified, but that also means that about 10 to 15% will not. And what we know is that the mutation detection rates have been increasing with improved techniques. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, our, we weren't able to identify um, as many patients as 90%, maybe only 80%, because our techniques were not good enough to actually pick up on, on everybody. Um, and we also know that there are different genes that can cause a phenotype or presentation that's really, really similar to Dravet syndrome. And we call those the Dravet syndrome mimics. But I think what's really important here is that Dravet syndrome itself remains a clinical diagnosis and a negative genetic test result does not preclude a clinical diagnosis. So you can still have Dravet syndrome without having an SCM1A mutation detected. So if, you're, if the clinical presentation of the child is really typical for Dravet syndrome, then that child should have a clinical diagnosis of Dravet syndrome, regardless of whether we were able to find the SCM1A gene or not. Yeah, I think that's really important um, because we've had families in the past saying, oh, we haven't had, the, our genetic test result was negative. But, and, and they've been told we haven't got Dravet syndrome. And that's not, that's strictly speaking, not correct. So you can have a situation where you have all the typical features of Dravet syndrome um, and um, that you might be SCM1A negative. Um, and that might just be the case that there's certain part, there might be certain mutations that at the moment we're just not able to detect. And maybe in 10 years time, that might be different. Yeah, so that's always, um, but what's important for families is that if your clinical phenotype, so if you know, the presentation of the child is really typical of Dravet syndrome, that warrants that the child has a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome and also gets all the support and the medication and everything else um, that will benefit um, that child. So, and this is just, a, um, just an illustration. This is a, a, a research um, study that was performed by Johannes Lemke um, in 2012 in Germany. 
And so they did some testing, what, what, what was then called um, next generation sequencing as a diagnostic tool for epileptic disorders. So basically what we did in the past, um, um, what I showed you before is the, our standard genetic testing techniques have been, have evolved. And now we've got better genetic te testing techniques. And what they've done is, so this group, they have tested a group of children um, that a, a large group of children that tested negative for all the common genes. And then they tested them again on what's called a bigger gene panel for lots of different genes. And what's really interesting is that what they found out was that actually um, three, so um, three out of four SEM1, SEM1, three out of four SEM1A mutations had been missed on the previous single gene testing. So these were individuals that were classed as SEM1A negative because they didn't find the mutation. And when they retested the family, uh, or when they retested the child, they suddenly found it. Yeah, so that's a good example that if you have a really classical, um, strong Jarvis syndrome phenotype uh, clinical presentation, and in the past, years ago, you've had a negative test result, it's worthwhile speaking to your doctor and say, well, actually, would you mind retesting? Um, because that might be beneficial just to see with use newer techniques to find out um, whether you know the SEM1A gene might have not been picked up in the past. I have to say that this this happened in, in Germany a lot in, in commercial laboratories. In the UK, I think our laboratory where we've tested most patients in the past, we haven't seen this. Um, so we haven't had cases um, that were missed um, in the past. Um, because I think our, our, our processes were quite rigorous in terms of um, um, uh, analysis. But it's definitely something, it's always, if you haven't got an answer, it's always uh, worthwhile having another look. And then, so what I meant, the point here at the bottom is to consider retesting of SM1 NG negative patients if the clinical presentation is suggestive of Jarvis syndrome. Yeah, so the clinical presentation is really important and having discussion with your clinician, with your child neurologist to say, well, actually, my child has Jarvis syndrome. We haven't found a, a variant a genetic mutation. It might be worthwhile um, having a look again. So, and then we've been looking at, the, in this paper, we've described some of the Jave mimics, and that's really some of these um, other uh, genetic disorders that might present in a very, very similar way to Jave syndrome. And this is um, Dora Steele, a doctor who's been working with us in the past, who's just been um, um, summarizing this. And here is just an illustration of this. So here you've got um, in gray, in the background, you can see what we call the Dravet syndrome phenotype. So these are all the children that present with typical features of Dravet syndrome. And you can see that, just illustrating that the majority, the vast majority of them will be caused by an SCM1A variant. But there's a number of other genes that might present in similar ways. So one particular candidate is PCH19. This is particularly in girls. Um, and they present with clusters of febrile seizures early on. And in the past, um, people thought, oh, this must be Dravet syndrome, when actually it was identified that this was um, PCH19 related epilepsy. Yeah? So you've got, there's a number of other genes that might mimic Dravet syndrome because they present in a very, very, very similar way. Yeah. And nowadays, what we try to aim for is, of course, to have a genetic diagnosis where we have a gene panel where um, you, you look for a number of genes just to make sure you um, pick out um, the right gene that explains, um, that explains the, the phenotype or it explains the disorder. Yeah. So the take home message here is really that, um, so the Dravet syndrome phenotype is mainly, in majority of cases, caused by SCM1A, but in, there are cases where we have Dravet syndrome mimics, which might be, um, which present like Dravet syndrome, um, but might be caused by different, uh, different disorders. Yeah. And we've also got more information on this on the newly updated Dravet syndrome UK website on, on genetics of Dravet syndrome, which we've um, just compiled. Yeah. So, and when about yeah, 10 years ago, we um, did a lot of research on how useful um, SCM1A genetic testing actually might be. And I'm actually very grateful for um, Jarvis Syndrome UK and to many, many of you probably in the audience um, who've actually contributed to this work and this study over 10 years ago. When we, con we contacted all the doctors and all the patients in the United Kingdom to give us their view 
of what they thought about genetic testing and whether they thought that was useful and to which degree that was useful. And um, so we send out questionnaires to parents and to carers and to doctors, and we send them to those that tested and that were rotation positive and negative, and had really uh, a really, really good response rate of um, over so 187 individuals um, out of 244 respondents. And that's really, I mean, I, I just can only thank you for, for, for really um, participating in this. But I think this is, and I think it's these studies like these are really important. If you have many patients participating, you get really useful results. I think if you only have got a very small group of patients, then you can't really draw any major conclusions. But if you've got a bigger group of patients, then I think it's uh, much more convincing uh, in terms of the uh, information that you can, you can gather. And here, what's, what's illustrated here is really that um, genetic testing is particularly important in the very, very, in the young children. Yeah, so this is an illustration of the percentage of cases uh, of patients where um, without a diagnosis when they were referred for genetic testing. So in infants and children less than one year of age when they were referred, um, more than 60% didn't have a diagnosis. Uh, in the first year of life, more than 40% didn't have a diagnosis. And by performing genetic testing, particularly in very, very young children, allowed us to make a diagnosis um, really, really early. And, and I think the parent views on genetic testing were um, really um, educational um, because in the majority it gave an explanation for the epilepsy and it also led to a change in medication which has been really important because that meant that medications that are contraindicated in Dravet syndrome were stopped and um, other medications that are helpful for children have been, uh, have been started. And for example, you had, um, there was different access to therapies. Yeah? And actually this shouldn't happen. So we think every, every child with um, Dravet syndrome should have full access to all therapies. Yeah? So it should really depend on the clinical diagnosis, not on the genetic diagnosis. It should really depend on the clinical diagnosis of this child having uh, Dravet syndrome that then um, uh, leads to access to um, uh, different therapies. And these are just some of the um, comments from the parents. So, and they've been, so we've been really, really impressed um, how significant this has been. So we were very relieved when the results came back. It was like a weight had been lifted after 12 years. So it meant that for 12 years, a family not knowing what was actually causing um, the, um, the epilepsy. Um, then it gave a reason for the epilepsy as before we kept blaming ourselves. More importantly, it gives some indication of to professionals what drugs to try. That's again, early diagnosis and knowing which, um, which medications to, to choose. It confirmed that management of conditions is paramount, scans, tests, surgery routes uh, are no, no, no longer necessary. And you all know this, going to a hospital, in and out of hospital, having lots of tests, scans, it's very, very burdensome for, for the child and also for the family. So it's important to have, um, to obtain a diagnosis quickly. And it finally, after 14 years, gave a diagnosis, which was helpful in, in form filling. And we now have a diagnosis and have set small goals for the future. Also, just so it's been important to, to know um, what is um, underlying this, and um, to which then helps you and also your child neurologist and, and, and the, the community around you to, to, to cope with this. And also um, to have, um, to have that, that confirmation. So one of the important aspects uh, was genetic counseling, and that's been also be addressed um, by you in the questions to us. So I think genetic counseling is really, really important. And I think just for the purpose of um, just getting more, obtaining more information, I think you're always better off having more information and qualified more detail, uh, information. So that's the importance to seek expert advice from the genetic counselor. And it will be an opportunity to learn more about the condition, about recurrence risks, and family planning. And that's really important for younger families. And um, this can be either a single appointment or could be a joint discussion with a number of professionals. Yeah, so you can have um, an appointment with a genetic counselor, but you can also ask to have an appoint a joint appointment. So we often, in Glasgow, we often offer joint appointments. We've got a child neurologist and a geneticist or a counselor together. And there's, there shouldn't be a reason why that shouldn't be possible, because I think you get just a broader view um, you get a, the view of your doctor as well as of the, of the counselor. 
And um, what I would recommend is seek support from, ex from the expert team of epilepsy nurse specialists and from doctors. So you, you should all see uh, a child neurologist who has got um, expertise in Dravet syndrome and you will have experienced nurse, uh, epilepsy nurse specialists. And it's really important to draw on their so, um, support and, um, and help. And then patient support groups uh, and charities such as Dravet syndrome UK are invaluable. Um, because of course, with managing this condition, you will become experts at these conditions, uh, at, this, uh, at, at, at Dravet syndrome. And I think it's really important to pass on that knowledge to, um, to other families. And, that's, and I think many of you would have had the same experience of having come in contact the first time. Just today I saw a family um, with a young child with an SCM1A mutation, and they were really relieved having been in touch uh, with Dravet syndrome UK because it was the first time they could talk to somebody who could actually understand what they're talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to have that option. And um, so if you, because one of the questions was that you haven't had, um, if you haven't had genetic counseling in the past and you're interested in that. So I think it's really, I would contact your local child neurologist and say, actually, we would like some genetic counseling because you've got some questions. And I think it's good to have some time because they will have time. So you will have at least an hour's appointment where you've got time to really answer all your questions and learn a bit more about the genetics and to make sense of that and also to understand the risks and then for family planning, I think that's all really important. So I think what's really become clear, and, and that's in the, in, the, in, the, in the greater scheme of things, that Dravet syndrome has really become a model to study childhood genetic epilepsies. Yeah? So Dravet syndrome has been really at the forefront of lots of research in uh, epilepsy generally and particularly in genetic epilepsy. So where we have got an epilepsy that is caused by one specific genetic uh, mutation. And we've come a long way since the 1950s when we learned first about sodium channels and then in the 70s when Charlotte Dravet actually first described Dravet syndrome and then we had the first um, drug steripental that's been particularly successful um, to treat seizures and then we had the first mouse models um, about 10 years ago and now we've had um, just over the last couple of years we've had two really important medication trials so we've had the fenfluramine trial and the cannabidiol trial um, which have been both really important and have changed um, our standard of care in terms of treatment for Dravet syndrome and what we've seen is that the, um, the development of gene therapy approaches for, um, for Dravet syndrome. And I think that's a really, really important um, development. And when we talk about particularly future opportunities for precision treatment, that is applicable to any disorder that is caused by one particular gene genetic change. And what we find the problem is in Dravet syndrome is that we have, where you should have, all of us carry two copies or two healthy copies of the SCM1A gene, which means that we can, we can produce enough healthy SCM1A protein to keep all our nerve cells functioning properly. And if you've got Dravet syndrome, then one of those copies is not working properly. So you have only 50% or, um, of, of your protein and that you should have. And the prospect of gene therapy, the idea of gene therapy is to somehow regulate this, to find a way to actually express more protein. So basically the deficient protein or the lack of protein that we find in Dravet syndrome to actually counterbalance that and find treatment avenues to actually increase the genetic expression of that particular protein. Yeah? And you can do that in different ways. You can do that, so, you've, you've, so gene therapy is already a reality, for example, in cancer, in your muscular disorders. So this is really, this, these are really techniques that over the last 10, 15 years have developed significantly and have become um, really, um, really important. And now for the first time are becoming important in epilepsy. So Dravet syndrome is really the first epilepsy where we consider, or one of the first epilepsies where we consider gene therapy approaches. And basically what you're trying to do is, is to boost your protein um, expression in, in, in the cell. So you've got not enough protein, you want to produce more protein, so you want your cell to produce more SCM1A protein. And you do that either by using viruses, 
So you might remember from your biology classes that viruses actually are very clever organisms and viruses use infiltrate um, the human body and cells and then implant their own DNA into our DNA and make our DNA present the proteins they want. And you can harness that ability of viruses to actually implant um, good parts of um, um, or additional um, scm one gene parts into the cell to make the cell um, produce more protein. Yeah, that's one of the ways um, you can approach this. There's the problem is with um, with the scm one gene. It's a really really large gene. So uh, other genes that are much smaller, that's, this approach has been much easier. So for Dravet syndrome and the scm one gene is really large. So it's been difficult to implant this um, into the cell. And there's been other approaches to try to do this by using actually splitting it into two and then having a smaller, smaller fragments that you can actually then implant into the cell. Yeah. Or you can have another approach which is called antisense or oligonucleotide approach is where you actually target the mRNA. So basically, you've got your gene um, that produces, that, trans, that then um, um, transcribes into the uh, RNA, and then you've tried to make the RNA produce more protein. Because in the end, what you want is you just want more protein. So whether you actually do it via the DNA route or by the, MR, uh, the RNA route, um, both would still um, yield in a higher protein um, count. So, so the gene therapy approaches for Dravet syndrome are, so the overall aim is to restore the deficient SCM1A protein production. Yeah. So to really make up for the, for the deficient um, um, SCM1A protein production. And you can do that to, via supplying a new copy of SCM1A by use of a virus. Yeah. So the um, AAV virus or lentivirus. And that's the Trojan horse approach that I explained earlier, where you try to um, supply a new copy via virus into the cell. The second option is that you can use, um, and that's so research wise, there's um, at the moment there are groups uh, across the world who try this. Yeah, so, but these have not, to my knowledge, they're not yet uh, in the clinic and they're also not yet in animal models. So these are still early stages where this approach is, uh, is, uh, is trialed. Then you have an approach where you use small um, RNA fragments to boost, um, boost SCM1A expression from healthy existing copies. Yeah? So we all have, so we have got two good copies or two existing copies. A child with Dravet syndrome will have one healthy copy. And what's then tried here is that you boost the expression, the protein expression of that healthy copy. Yeah? And um, so this approach has already been tried in the mouse model and it's been really successful. And this is now being given approval to also try uh, in, in human patients. And the first trial, that's um, Stokes Therapeutics in America, they've had the first patient um, with Dravet syndrome who's um, entered the trial was in August um, last month. So this is, this is already reality, yeah? And then we have um, another option is to boost the SCM1A gene expression in the cell. And there's also a company, a gene therapy company, who's expecting to start trials in humans and um, human um, SCM1A um, driver patients um, next year. So you've got at least two companies who already over the next couple of years will uh, bring this um, into clinical trials. And then we need to see how effective these new treatment approaches are. And there's certain questions that we don't know yet. So we don't, so we, we talked about um, that we need to express more SCM1A protein, but we don't know what happens with overexpression. What if we express too much? Um, might, might that be harmful, might it not be harmful? So these of course are therapies that we have to learn still an awful lot about. Yeah? So these are new therapies that have worked in other diseases, but they haven't worked in all diseases. So there have been diseases where you thought, oh, this, this will work, and then you, this was tried and then didn't work. So I think we have to be careful about, um, so this is, I think this is very, very promising, um, but we haven't really seen the effects yet in um, patients and how they responded to that and how successful this might have, uh, how successful this might be. So, and what's 
one aspect that's really important is, um, particularly if we talk about um, new um, therapies, even the new uh, medications such as cannabidiol and fenfluramine, and coming back to the beginning when I spoke about Dravet syndrome really being an iron channel disorder, it doesn't, it doesn't only cause seizures, but you've got uh, cognitive problems, motor movement problems, all that's really important. And of course, what we want to make sure is when, whenever we've got new treatments, have we got biomarkers, which means have we got markers that tell us that the treatment is actually working, not just by looking at how many seizures an, in, uh, an individual might have, but also what effect might this have on cognition? What effect might this have, this have on, um, on, on mobility? And I'm afraid we haven't got enough data um, to actually measure this. So you need really good quality data of what the natural history of individuals with SCM1A related epilepsies um, are. And so that's really, so we are, just in the process um, across the United Kingdom to um, develop uh, what's called a natural history study of all individuals with SCM1A related epilepsy. And this means that we are um, aiming to involve everybody in the United Kingdom with um, an SCM1A uh, mutation to uh, be monitored very closely every six months um, with um, all the measurements from what seizure frequencies are like, but also with neurocognitive measurements to see what cognition is doing. And, and that will give us then a good baseline and will help us to understand how Dravet syndrome over time develops and it will give us a baseline to say from which we can then compare and to say, well, we've got these new treatments and actually these treatments are helpful because we can see there's other changes that we notice. Yeah, and this is so. This is uh, uh, an effort that is um, um, really, um, you know, born out of a collaboration out of uh, of all the child neurologists uh, across the United Kingdom. So I think we're very fortunate that we've got colleagues across the United Kingdom who work really closely together. So we see Helen Cross, you know, um, from London. Samir is a very my colleague, colleague here in Glasgow. So we are leading on this project, but we'll have. Um, um, over 20 centers across the United Kingdom who will all participate in this. Yeah, so there shouldn't be any child across or any individual across the United Kingdom who, sh who should not have access, so that everybody should have access to this study that we hope to uh, commence next year. Yeah, so, and it's just to emphasize that um, the emergence of drugs effective at reducing seizure burden, um, so we know that, but we need, we need to know more about the impact on cognition and development. And we need to understand the natural history of Dravet syndrome um, and really to start to measure uh, treatment success beyond seizure control. Um, and this will allow us, and, and to, by, by, while gathering this information, this really will allow us to have good data in the future um, uh, going forward to evaluate whether new treatments are actually um, helpful in Dravet syndrome. So um, speak to your child neurologist about this. Um, and um, so, and also, um, so um, Dravet syndrome UK has been really supportive with regards to this um, effort. And um, so we will, um, and, and Dravet syndrome UK will also keep you updated as to how we're getting on with the natural history study in the future. And this leads me to the end of the presentation.